it's so good to see you and uh, so good to be here uh, virtually uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, thank you, Larry. And Martine, congratulations on your new book. I was just thinking the first time I remember we read together was 1992 in Battery Park in New York when my book, My Father's Geography came out. I remember that. I remember us standing at the refreshment table talking together. But it's good to be here. And um, I want to start off with something that uh, Eleanor referenced, which is my actual departure from the factory. I had my first book published. And I've been watching this program on HBO, which is really good. It's called Black Art in the Absence of Light. And the launching, so to speak, of that program is David Driscoll and uh, talking about the exhibit he did of, of Black Art in uh, 1976. And it just so happens that um, his artwork is on the cover of my very first book and it's called Water Song. And you can see there's a woodcut on this side. That's David Driscoll's work. And uh, he led me into his studio at the University of Maryland College Park and said that I could just pick any images that I wanted. And my editor, Charles Rowell, and I sell it on the woodcut, all right? And the very first poem in the book is what I like to read because I think it touches on some of the things I'll be reading about today. It's entitled Borders. I have seen lines on a paper turn four lane highways to roads, snaking through clusters of pine raise foot high grass and medians, pull the tongues of people to a draw, tighten the air and fill it with honey. Put the hands of women on their hips, stand them in peanut fields with straw hats, slow the paces of men to a crawl and sit them on the gas pumps of one room stores, and scratch belligerence in the eyes of whites. I have gone south in summer nights Watching the sun rise haughty and oppressive, I have felt God tinker with man's differences, moving through our quarter spaces, making strangers of the same flesh and blood. And uh, in keeping with art now, it's spirit boxing the phoenixes. And um, it was quite a treat that day to be able to read the poets from mainland China that I've gotten to know over the years. And we were gathered there to celebrate Xu Bing's Flying Phoenixes. And so the title is Xu Bing's Flying Phoenixes in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. I am 64. Millions of lives are buttons on the coats of magnificent birds that arise from lost memories of building China from under waves of assaults. In Beijing, 10 years earlier, I wait with poets and students to walk and speak, wandering through this language of aging with Scherger, poet once homeless, now sung as mythic ancestor of generations in the word. These buttons on birds of metal rising from ashes are lives of men and women who went into jobs who never came home who came home and died for pipe dreams or dreams of a country, the dust bowl lifting up from starving families in the grapes of wrath, the shuffling armies of black sharecroppers leaving the South for the North harsh ways under waves of assaults. In Kunming, I sit in a Muslim restaurant with a poet who gave me the Quran in Chinese while around me, Folks celebrate the end of a day of work, sitting in a park, listening to the Erhu, its eloquent moaning where Yu Jin sings about working in a metal factory. While Wang Xiaoni worked on a farm later to be the first woman to write after re-education. What do we know when we die, when our poetry writes history? I am 19 three Negro classics for lunch, a worker poet in an America where our soldiers kill our students. We are pilgrims in our souls. John Henry sleeping in high grass. 
Mowers miles away, mud flies on top his hammer like they own it, his chest cresting and falling in shapes, shifting between sunlight and leaves, black steel his destiny. John is motion at rest, tides of moon and waves and still waters, suns igniting hearts of molten iron, a hardened conviction rose petals and rain. Sleep is a dream, the real world a poundage, work a sentence for being his mama's son, the hammer in his crib, the supernatural, a drum song of woodpeckers, cowbells in the field, heaven, a home going back to a place before the bugle call to be born. When I was uh, deciding to write this book, I was thinking that it would be as my 15th collection, A Return to Water Song. So this is actually Water Song all grown up or more grown up than it was in 1985. Looking back on it at this point, I think about the question of what industrial culture has done to earth and whether or not industrial culture can save us from what industrial culture, industrial culture has done and how industrial culture is related to slavery, the method of production and managing people in, in factories is based on management science from the period of American slavery. So um, the lay of paradise, 1970. So I went into the steel mill right after the shootings at Kent State and uh, Jackson State in Mississippi. The Lay of Paradise, 1970. Three-story overhead electric cranes clicking, tractors large enough to carry elephants rolling, mashing the wooden brick floor down, down, still pins spinning so fast they have a silent hiss. Shears cutting shiny tin into thin plates at speeds fast enough to cut the bone away so cleanly, a man has to remember to scream. The bailers pulling scrap tin, arms, legs, heads onto the pen to make them small enough to be melted, sold as Cadillacs or prayed over in graves. The soles of safety shoes of men and women tapping metal plated walkways to workstations. I sit and sew word onto word when the mill is down. I study the invocation and wait to see a poem come out from the skylight in the mesh of corrugated metal walls, a web of language looking like nothing but carrying everything that makes everything, the crucible of metaphor. I am a child in the art. The art is a child in me. In the world of industrial jobs in Baltimore at that time, 1970, you could literally walk from one job to another, but that's gone. As a matter of fact, you can't do that in too many places in this country right now, for sure. And I left the steel mill and went to Procter & Gamble, a soap manufacturer right there on the harbor near the downtown place they built for tourists. And I stayed there for 14 years. And I had a job at times of stacking product on the floor. And some of those boxes weighed 100 pounds. There were these giant boxes of ivory soap. And when I saw them coming around the conveyor belt, I've steadied myself because they weighed as half as much as I did. Spirit boxing. It is the tightness in the gut when the load is heavy enough to knock me over backward turn me back on my heel until my ankle cracks and I holler out, Jesus, this Jesus of Joe Gans, setting up for the next punch while taking in one that just made his soul wobble. The grunt I make when the shift is young, my body a heavy meat on bones, conveyors not wired for compassion, trucks on deadlines, uncaring pressure of a nation waiting to be washed made clean, me looking into the eye of something like death. And I look up 
throwing 50 pound boxes. Jesus, now John Henry, pounding visions of what work is. The wish for black life to crumble, snap under all it is given. These three souls of spirit, hands like hammers, a hammer like the word made holy, word echoing a scripture from inside the wise mind that knows men cannot be makers, that in making we want to break each other, ache moving us to refuse to surrender to time in factories, catacombs, feeding on the spirit. There was a, um, a truck driver, I was a, a soft spot in my heart for truck drivers. And um, I, I, Procter & Gamble, those, of those 14 years, I spent 10 in the warehouse because the production lines weren't very conducive to writing poetry. It wasn't safe to take your mind off of all that machinery. But once I got into the warehouse in 75, I think that's when I put together my first manuscript and that became Water Song, it took 10 years to get it published. But in the warehouse, I could move around. I had a sweeper, I could ride on that. I stuck books behind my seat next to a sandwich and uh, would hide in a corner of the warehouse. But um, the truck drivers in those 10 years were just uh, very interesting people. And when the pandemic hit, they were the first people I thought of because this country doesn't realize Stuff doesn't come by magic when you press the button on a computer, it goes on a truck or an airplane or a train. Right? A truck driver from West Virginia, he called himself Billy, although we knew he had another name. Him here telling us how he hated white people, him as white as the white people we knew, but crisscrossed over in his mind by the groove Appalachia makes up and down the back of this country. His blues were made on the backs of folk more blue than black folk origins of the blues. Billy so loud he could make loud hide itself in white shame. Taking his breaks with us, waiting for his truck to be filled with what washed the dirty laundry of a country he believed did not believe in him. Tipsy drunk as he was on the days he announced to us he was a hillbilly, like a lone wolf howling, sitting on his back legs lost in the woods, afraid of what to feel in a space empty of whiteness, filled with strange cruelties. This the holy space of who can look down at us. His arm in a cast, Billy broke a thing harder than he was, the thing that tried to let him own a certain kind of dignity, the cab of his rig easing out of the truck yard, his baseball cap bouncing him back to the hills. And uh, some of my family members are here on, on, the, uh, on the reading in the Zoom boxes and uh, they probably know, they may not know that uh, when I left Procter & Gamble, my father was very upset. He thought I was just throwing my life away. He said, boy, that's the best job you could ever have. Why are you gonna walk away from that? And so uh, it took me about five years to get back to the salary and academia I had when I was in, left the warehouse. And my father was not impressed until I told him I had medical insurance, Never mind the poetry, so. And I'd like to read one more from Spirit Boxing before I go on to a few things that are somewhat new, some very new. And um, the repack room. So I'm 69 years old. And um, if I had stayed in the factory, I would have been given a job in the warehouse in the repack room. And uh, it's where guys like me with bad knees and arthritis and bad backs Repack soap when the boxes busted, you got new boxes and put the soap in and you drank coffee, played crossword puzzles, and listened to the radio all day and nobody bothered you, you know? You would put out the pasture and still, and some of those guys left that job with close to a million dollars in stock that they got through profit sharing. But sadly enough, some of them didn't live very long after they retired. Yeah. 
But they told me just before I left, for about two or three years, they said to me, <laughs> walk into the repack room, walking side to side on bad knees. They said, they said, you better get out of here before you end up like us, the repack room. A coffee pot and chairs for tired joints, the morning paper, our warehouse was a kinder place to men in their late years. Old timers who hobbled from leg to leg on sore knees that had climbed up onto forklifts for 40 years, had fallen, slipped, and fell on the cement floor when it took on ice in winter, and the galvanized walls made winter sharper when we forgot our thermals or forgot we were getting too old to be without them. This was the company's blind eye turned to men who could not still keep up with production lines and quotas for loading trucks, men who had fought in World War II and Korea, who had loaded shells on giant anti-aircraft guns on ships at sea, defending home and coming home to make what was a fortune to the poor and pennies to the rich. One sore knee to the other, one strained back to the other, one set of clogged and swollen arteries to another, trading pictures of their grandchildren, planning trips to Mexico, and the evening of a life of duty. And now in my evening, I think of duty, of who owns us and what gifts we give now that I am old enough for the repack room the slow job of salvaging good bars of soap from busted boxes, the spirit of my old worker sitting in an office with books. So many was the day when I was sitting in my office there at Simmons with that endowed chair, wonder what am I doing here? Yeah. So um, I will read, I was just made professor emeritus. I'm very happy about that at Simmons. So that was really great. And I have uh, some things uh, here to read uh, to close out with the last few minutes or so. And uh, this is a manuscript that's sort of pulling itself together. I found, I found myself writing about things specifically relating to racial violence and slavery off and on over the years. And I just wanted to read some of these things to you. This one is entitled, My First Gun. I grew up in East Baltimore. And uh, part of my neighborhood was used for the TV show, The Wire. On the other side of Milton Avenue, over by Mufford, it was this um, block or so of abandoned buildings. Anyway, and then also a corner store I recognized. My first gun. Not even a week out of prison, he's sticking the thing in my face, six inch barrel, 22 or 38 ages I just might not make. Minding my business or minding his in our world, the top of the hill, high point of the valley, Milton Avenue, our grave. This is a world folk will name with cameras, the corner and later the wire, sad stories of children not yet born, our children, cherubs. A gun changes things, changes your mind and not even a week out of prison, he's sticking the thing in my face and I count the chambers, six chambers, six the sum of two times sacred three. Three, the number of parts of God or a liquor bottle, the cap, the head, the body, a shallow torso to break. A gun changes things, changes your black mind, makes you want one to talk back to the one pointing in your face, but dumb guns don't talk, they wait. When they speak, they speak in thunder, the loud tap on the body to demand that it open itself up edges of black skin screaming the way angels cry. Blues in 454, The Violence in Chicago. In movies about the end of our civilization, toys fill the broken spaces of cities, flipping over in streets where children are all hoodlums big kids painting themselves in neon colors while the women laugh following the men into a love of madness. Still shots show emptiness tearing the eyes of the last of us who grew to be old, the ones the hoodlums prop up in shadows, throwing garbage at us, taping open our eyes, forcing us to study the dead 
in photos torn from books and burned down libraries. Chicago used to be Sundays at Gladys's luncheonette where church folk came and ate collard greens and chicken after the sermons that rolled out in black churches, sparkling tapestries of words from preachers' mouths, prayer books, tongues from Tell Me Alabama or Walk On Mississippi. Now light has left us, the sun blocked out by shreds of what history becomes when apathy shreds it, becoming a name the bad children give themselves as they laugh and threaten each other while we starve for the laughter we were used to before the end came. I met Lucille Clifton in the winter of 1974 to 75, just as I was working on the original manuscript of uh, Water Song. And I was moving from the packing floors to the warehouse and Lucille was such a good friend and a mentor, although we never talked about mentoring. Um, I just knew that I could pick up the phone and call Lucille and read a poem to her and she would listen. And this is an elegy for her, an elegy for Lucille with an epigraph from her book, Slave Ships, that a lot of phrase, onto a heathen country. It's the old Shirley Highway, the road a woman inspired flattened the curves, the way for farmers to go home. I turn to hear the way you reach deep in the crevice of a tail to let me know the secrets of how to get through. There is a fire in the hills, are we lost? In my father's last new car, the green Chevy he brought, bought from Charlie Irish just as I was getting to know the price. Mill towns drop out of the lips of clouds the way buffalo must have puffed at night and I know the legend you are. There is a fire in the hills, are we lost? If a radio could catch the frequency of a magic woman with ears to heaven, it would sit still now between us. The words rise up from the way we lose time in the fold of by and by the slipped anacrusis of gospels. There is a fire in the hills, are we lost? On June 17th, 2015, a young white man walked into Mother Emanuel AME Church and sat down, spent time with the people he later killed. What a fellowship is the title of this from the hymn, what a fellowship, what a grace divine, etc. for Mother Emanuel AME. In these clasped hands, we see the seeds of what has come to be the tiny black faces of children chained into ships headed to sea, not an invitation to a better life, not a vote for the human, but the deadened greed, a wish against what life means to the living, a cruelty above the requirements of evil. Our ambition to live, to survive, to grow beyond chains now, our only hope in row after row of bloody pews. In these clasped hands, we see the business of selling human beings, white hands of banks, the black hands of enemies, selling enemies to regal promenades in France and Belgium, to arrogant philosophies of enlightenment, a plotting Kant, a foolish Hume, murderers in the name of knowledge, architects of theft, a broad sweep to rape the world and grow fat, to assume, to consume, to accumulate, to kill. In these clasped hands, we see the endless heart, proud hands that bent heads down to save them, caring souls that made a new love from carnage, the wreckage of lives, piles of bones, crumbling to dust and mounds all around, forming breath from stench, forming the sweet Sunday dinner after church, after gathering the word of this new God with the promise of a redeemer, a hand with the power to end death's bondage. In these clasped hands, we hear the songs, the mourning, the celebration from worlds left in Africa forgotten except in the pulse of what we remember of the drum, 
the stop of holy dances, of invoking the Holy Spirit to visit, opening our prayer to wind, to fire, to the great wash of oceans, to mountains rising and falling in visions, to dominions over fish, fowl, beast, and Eden's contract. In these clasped hands, we hear Philadelphia, white crochet crowns on heads of our matrons waiting to receive communion, throats clearing for the next hymn, the ritual cheers to pastors stuck in old sermons, the occasional Baptist eruption in misty AME precision, the way we wind the stairs to building a life where the brick and mortar are the bone and soul of courage, of the get on up now somehow. In these clasped hands, we hold the hope of another day braided on strands of grief across what divides us, what makes us one. And I will read just one more poem and then uh, turn it over to my friend Martin to celebrate his new book. And um, let me just say from that last poem, was that phrase, uh, get on up. And it's a kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's a phrase that's sort of written inside my spirit. And from what I, you know, I grew up in Baltimore, which is to my understanding, my experience of Southern city, raised by Southerners. And uh, if life got a little hard, you fell down, old folk would say, get on up now, get up, you know? So that's how we, we get through, get up. Don't just sit there or lie there, get on up. And this last piece is ephemera. It was published in The Nation uh, a week ago, actually, February 20th. And uh, well, it's one of my pandemic poems. I didn't write many pandemic poems. This might be the only one. Ephemera. Each morning I sit in silence. The time slides, changes in my heart, a moss covered cavern where its fire wakes me to a camaraderie of light. My wife waking upstairs to walk to her window to pray, to gaze outward at the pasture where Wappinger people eyed white men making laws to own people and the land. Art rules this old house, its rough rafters set in earth as the colony became a state and Poughkeepsie forgot its own wonder, a gathering of reeds on banks of a river Hudson believed would take him to China. His breath unnoticed these days by the hummingbirds that visit our door, sounds of their wings, like my fingers tapping my mother's empty Tupperware bowl with cake batter, a thin film she let me lick only when I was good to taste something I let leave as I sit waiting to be aware, woke as some say. I imagine the sun, its fire, its electricity, waiting for us when we have lived all we can live, hoped all we can hope, some of us snatched away by the virus, corona raft of a world disturbed. Surprised as we are by nature's decisions, we refuse to surrender, to let go of what kills us when we try to control all of what we cannot see. Our house is now inside me. It is me, I am it, my bowels and spine, its forgotten birth, my thinning skeleton, now its heavy rafters, my emptiness, its emptiness, my fullness, its fullness, or ideas of the breath, our two minds held still by the fastening of it all hook and joint, sinew and bone. Thank you.